All right, let's look to God's word this morning. We're going to be in 1 John chapter 3 as we are working our way through 1 John chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at uh, verses 1 through 3 this morning. Uh, there was a phrase that we actually sang in that uh, the first worship song uh, this morning. And that phrase, you're going to see it uh, come out in this passage. Uh, so it wasn't by happenstance that this happened. Uh, but we have this hope fixed within us. So let me read. Uh, See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him, purifies himself, just as he is pure. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray, uh, thanking you, Lord, as the young people, uh, children learned this past week, that you love us. And we thank you, Lord, that for all of those who love you, uh, that you have a purifying hope within us that looks forward to your coming or our going to be with you. And so, Father, we pray that you would use your word today to encourage us to be faithful in our Christian lives, and Lord, that we would love you and seek to serve you all the days that you have for us. Bless your word today, we pray, Lord, that you would use it in our lives, teach us and instruct us, encourage us in faithfulness to you, for we pray in Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen. 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 The uh, the renowned artist, uh, Paul Gustave Doré, Uh, lost his passport. Now, he was in the 19th century. Uh, He was traveling throughout Europe, and he came to a border crossing, which is unusual today in in Europe, and he explained his predicament to one of the guards. And he gave his name to the official, and Doré hoped that he would be recognized because of his fame and allowed to pass. The guard, however, said that many people attempt to cross a border by claiming to be someone that they are not. And Doré insisted that he was the man, and he was who he claimed to be. The guard, the official, said, all right, I'll give you a test. And if you pass the test, I'll let you through. And he handed him a piece of uh, paper and pencil, and he told him to sketch all the different peasants that were standing nearby. And he did it quickly and skillfully. The guard was convinced enough that he allowed him to go through because he could prove who he claimed to be. As we look at the Word of God this morning, we're going to see that, uh, yes, Doré's work uh, confirmed who he was, and we should be able, others should be able to see within us who we claim that we are. We looked at that idea, that concept last week. But here again today in 1 John chapter 3, in these first three verses, the apostle also says that our work should match up or our words should match up to our profession. Our profession should match up to our work. Or as we say sometimes in, in America, The proof is in the pudding, right? The proof is in the pudding. So what we claim to be should really match what we are, or what we are should really claim what we, or match what we say that we are. And so as we look here in these three verses, we're going to realize three important reasons why we are to grow up in Christ. Now, the purpose of the first book of John is to encourage Christians to love one another, to love one another, because the reason for that because God is love. We're to love one another. You say, Chris, this is really elementary, right? It is. Yes, it is. And when you have mastered it, let me know. Okay? (laughs) Love one another. Because I know I haven't mastered this one yet. The other purpose that John was writing was to combat various forms of heresies that had crept into the early church. Last week, we looked at the idea of Gnosticism and what this was and how it was influencing the church with false teachers who were coming in and beginning to try to teach wrong doctrine that would lead them astray from the truth and into error. So our desire, and John's desire, was to see the flock grow up in Christ, and that's exactly what our desire would be today as well, that we would grow up in Christ. And so three important reasons why we are or how we can grow up in Christ is what we will see here today in these first three verses of 1 John chapter 3. Now, John is writing... And he says, first of all, the Father's great love has made us his children, and it distinguishes us from the rest of the world. You have a mark on you. You have a calling. You have a seal that God has placed upon you 
because you love God, because God has loved you. God's great love has been bestowed upon us. Now, John is writing that. And years ago, I heard an expositor preaching on this passage. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God, and such we are. It's almost as though John is writing this, and he writes that down, and then he realizes, it's true, we are. And he's impressed by the idea of it. God's great love should never, ever fail to amaze us. The Apostle John was one of the most blessed men of history. Why? Because the prophets of old longed to see what John saw. John was with Christ for three years. John saw the miracles. Uh, John saw Jesus' transfigured glory. John had seen him his death. John had seen his burial. John had seen his bodily resurrection. And yet now, as an old man, John states that what really amazes him to the very core of his being is how great a love the Father has for us that we should be able to be called children of God. That word see, uh, maybe your translation says behold, it's an exclamation. It's an exclamation. It's also a command with that too, saying that the great love the Father has for us should amaze us. His love is amazing. Don't ever let that get commonplace in your life. And I know it's very easy for that to happen as we're Christians and the older we get or the more that we've walked with the Lord or, uh, for a length of time. But you've got to remember, when John is writing this, he is approaching arguably 90 years of age, 85, maybe 90 years of age. He's been walking with the Lord uh, arguably 60 years now. And the idea of the love of God could have grown weaker, right, more distant of a memory over time. But that's not what's happening. John is saying that the love of God should fill us with an awe and a wonder and a worship that he, the entire sovereign of the entire universe, would set his love on a rebel like you or me is amazing. Isn't that good news for this morning? God set his love on you, on me, while yet we were still sinners. And guess what? John wrote that one too, all right? He did that, and it should amaze us. If you're having a bad day, the best thing I can tell you is God loves you. God has set his love on you, and I don't care how bad the day is going. If you know that, it's going to be a good day. The Father's love should instruct us. It says, see or behold, again, that word. It's not only a command that John is saying something like, hey, stop everything you're doing and look at this. Think about, think about uh, ponder the significance is kind of what John is saying here. The word translated how great literally means what kind of. So see how great, see what kind of a love the Father, and it implies an astonishment that John had for what he was even writing about. John was writing about the love that God had for us, and he was astonished. And you can almost read between the lines, it's as though he is saying, where does this love come from? And he says, I, you know, we don't see this in the world. It's a heavenly, only God could have this type of love. George Matheson, a great hymn writer, was born with an eye condition that left him blind by the time he was 18 years of age. He was jilted at the altar by his fiancée while in his 20s and, uh, because she didn't want to marry a blind preacher. At 40 years of age, he was attending his younger, youngest sister's wedding, and a severe depression fell over his soul as he considered his condition. He'd never married. He was very upset about this, seeing his youngest sister marry him. And, uh, and he said that he had a real darkness of the soul, an, op an oppression, a depression that came upon him. Do you know that he began to think about the love of God? He began to think about the love of God, and there's that wonderful hymn that he penned, O oh, love that will not let me go. The first verse reads this, O oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe that in thine ocean steps its flow may richer, fuller be. You see, in his blindness, in his loneliness, perhaps feeling forsaken by the love of a woman, Matheson sought and found comfort in the unchanging love of God. You know, he wrote that entire hymn in five minutes' time, and there was never a correction that he made to it. 
That's inspired, right, when you do that. That's inspired. The love of God. The Father's great love has been bestowed upon us as a gift. And John exclaims the wonderful fact that this gracious love is bestowed upon each one of us as a gift. We need to cultivate the habit of thankful remembrance of what God has done for us. The love of God for us in the sacrifice of Christ. There are so many things that crowd into our lives daily, aren't there? They can make us ungrateful. They can make us forgetful. They can make us discouraged or make us depressed in life. Uh, and yet, you know, human love, it's a wonderful thing, but it's not the love of God. Uh, our possessions and uh, our relationships here on earth, they, they can bring us joy or, or happiness to some degree, but the joy that we ultimately have in life is when we recognize God's unchanging love for us. The Apostle Paul prayed for the Ephesians in chapter 3, verses 17 and 19, that you, they, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the, full and the depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses all understanding. Here what Paul is saying, Paul is giving them an impossible task. He's saying, I pray that you'll understand what, is under, what you can't fully understand. I pray that you'll understand the length and the breadth and the width and the height and the depth of the love of God, but you can't. But you can spend a lifetime trying. And you know what? We'll spend an eternity figuring it out in person. About a year ago, a very generous individual gave me a wonderful gift, uh, a new riding lawnmower. And I want to tell you, I've come a long way since my days back in South Carolina. And uh, back in South Carolina, when we were first married, we had an old push mower that would periodically backfire. And it would shoot flames out the muffler three feet. I used to love, we, had a, we lived right on the front of a road. A lot of people used to run, uh, you know, jogging, running by or riding their bikes. I used to love to mow up front. And those guys would be running by and just backfire, poof, you know, shoot flames at them. And they'd jump up. And I'd have a wonderful time with that. And uh, this, this mower, it did not have a shutoff. It, it, the shutoff was broken. And uh, so what I would have to do is push it into a shrubbery and, you know, to kill it. You just hit the blade into the shrubbery. And I figured, you know, I didn't have to, I didn't have to trim the shrubs either. So it was kind of, uh, it, was, it, was, it was nice in both ways. Uh, and my wife got a little bit irritated with me and said, you know, we, we really are bringing the neighborhood down. So I, I figured out, you know, I figured out how to fix at least a couple of things on that mower, had it for a few more years. But yeah, last year, somebody, generous individual, gave me a riding red Aaron's 36-inch riding mower, safety features. It doesn't shoot flames out. I kind of missed that. But uh, uh, it does all those things. And every time I'm on that mower riding it around, and it's funny because now everybody in the family wants to mow, you know. Before that, nobody wanted to mow, but now you've got the nice riding mower. Everybody wants to mow. And uh, whenever I'm out there, and it's pretty rare actually nowadays, uh, I always say, God, thank you for person X and the generous gift that this is. And God, I want to thank you because you put it in that person's heart to give that uh, to me. And I just want to thank you for that ride around and it, you know, mowing's an enjoyable experience then, isn't it? Because I'm reminded it's a tangible reminder. Well, I want you to look at the thing that's up on the wall behind me. It's got a cross. That's a tangible reminder of the love of God for you. The love of God for me. You know, when we take communion, first Sunday of every month, that's a tangible reminder of the love of God for you, for me. Uh, when, and we should... As I said earlier, we should attempt to remember that daily. Because when we get depressed, when we get discouraged, when we become overcome by the things in this life, it is usually because we have lost focus on the love of God in our lives. We're focusing on everything else. We're focusing on the kids. We're focusing on the school assignments. We're focusing on the business. We're focusing on whatever it is. And we've lost focus on the love of God. Just look at that. What John was facing, we don't even know the half of what John faced. That we should be called the children of God. Wow, and such we are. Such we are. I want you to think about that passage this week. When you get up in the morning, you get ready to get out of bed, I want you to think about it. You are a child of God. 
And you can even say, wow, and such I am. Wow. Consider God's great love for you. Bestowed, that word that's used there, literally means to be given, as I said, as a gift. That love of God is not purchased. It is not earned. It is not deserved. It is God's unmerited favor. It is God's grace. The Apostle Paul emphasized this in Romans chapter 5, uh, verses 6 through 10. You can read that. And, and we can see, you know, that outside of Christ we are helpless, ungodly sinners, enemies of God. But when Christ saves us, we are his children. Think about that. In uh, Prince Caspian by C.S. Lewis, in Prince Caspian, there's about, I don't know, a couple hundred pages of theology written into two sentences. Lewis had that ability, right? He said, in Prince Caspian, there's this interaction that takes place. You come of the Lord As uh, Adam and Lady Eve, says Aslan, and that is both honor enough to erect the head of the poorest beggar and shame enough to bow the shoulders of the greatest emperor on the earth. What do you mean by that? Shame, because at our very root, at our heart, we are sinners, right? We have fallen short of the glory of God. But it's enough to raise even the poorest beggar because why? You were created in the image of God. And if, God is, if Christ is your Savior and you are one of his children, you have every reason to rejoice. Every reason to rejoice. Well, second of all, look in the the. Uh, the Two, verse 2, verse 3 here. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared as to what we shall be. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he himself is pure. God's love purifies believers. God's love purifies believers. In other words, if you're in Christ, you will grow in Christ. If you're in Christ, you will grow in your relationship with Christ. John states that we have a purifying hope within us. I've read, you know, and we all know people who've done these, these detox diets have become all the rage in America. You drink and eat vile things and hopefully you're going to feel better after you do that. I don't know. I think it's better just to eat barbecue and whatever. Uh, but no, uh, anyways, they will, you know, detox, and, they'll, and it's referred to as cleanses. And they, they've maintained their popularity over the last few years, and devotees claim that they help rid the body of toxins and give your digestive tract uh, a much-needed break, and the intended results are feeling younger, healthier, more energized, maybe lose weight, whatever it may be. Detoxes typically fall into categories, you know, of either, as I said, fluids or liquids or, or minerals or, or all those types of things, and the idea is to cleanse your, your body. And detoxes are advertised as the mean to rid the body of all these excessive or excess toxins that we get in our, few, uh, in our food, maybe to help improve our, our immune or our digestive system, maybe restart our, our metabolisms or whatever. Well, I want you to look at verses 2 and 3 again because... There's a detox system there for us as believers. There's a purifying system there. Living in this world is more than a little bit toxic, right? Right? Yeah, I mean, not just the filth, moral filth that we see, but uh, just the poison that this world can be. Sometimes you just feel totally overwhelmed, right? Feel totally overwhelmed by what's going on. Need a detox. Well, the Apostle John directly confronts this and tells us that our understanding of our present position as children of God and our future hope of being like him will motivate us to grow in holiness now. Now. Not later, but now. Look at the verse. Verses 2 and 3 are directly related, closely related to verse 1, right? Right? Uh, it, verse 2 hammers the truth home. We are children of God now. So therefore, let us let that saturate, let it dominate our thinking and dominate every area of your and my life. And when we do that, it's going to naturally begin to purify how we relate, how we act, what we do, what we say. 
So realize, first of all, who you are in Christ. I'm convinced that the majority of the sins that we struggle with in this life are because we don't understand our position in Christ. Because we don't understand who we are in Christ. Now you think about that. Does it make a difference, the family that you're raised up in? Does it make a difference? Yeah, it does. It doesn't mean it's unchangeable, but can it make a difference? Yeah, certainly. Some children grow up in abusive homes where anger and uh, drugs or alcohol abuse are common. The TV, the Internet spews forth its filth and derision. Holy things are mocked. The Bible's never read. There's no family prayer. There's no moral training. The extent of wisdom is make sure you have safe sex or some other stupid phrase that people will say today. Now compare that to the child who grows up in the home where the husband loves and cherishes his wife and treats her lovingly with gentleness. The wife submits to the husband's headship. The children are instructed into the things of God. They're taken to Sunday school. They go to church. Prayers, Bible reading are modeled in the home. There's virtue. There's industry. There's sobriety that's held in high esteem. Which one wouldn't want to be raised in the second home? There's a difference. There's a difference. Think of how each child can be affected in each of those types of settings. Well, realize you're in the second house. If you're in Christ, and I don't care if you were raised physically in that first house. Okay, many of us were. I don't care. But if you know Christ, if you know God as your father, you're in the second house now. So act like it. We're in that house. We're being raised in that way. And if you have children, God's given you the responsibility to do that now for your family. Live differently because you've been called from darkness, as we saw a week ago, into light. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones once wrote in uh, Children of God, I do feel that this is perhaps the greatest weakness of all in the Christian church, that we fail to realize what we are and who we are. I think if Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said that, Probably pretty good reason to believe that. That's probably pretty true, pretty accurate. He went on to say that most of our unhappiness is due to our failure to relate our trials to our glorious position as children of God. Do you ever think about the trials that you go through in a week in relation to the fact that you're a child of God and God is allowing this right now in your life and we should ask ourselves, why is God allowing this in my life right now? If we only, he goes on to add, if only we realized who we are, then the problems of conduct would almost automatically be solved. He says, the more I read the New Testament, the more I am impressed by the fact that every appeal for conduct and good living and behavior in the Bible is always made in terms of our, in relation to terms of our position in Christ. Godly conduct rests on our understanding of our true, great position as children of God. You know, the last few weeks, we've seen all sorts of Christian leaders, song leaders, and uh, pastors, and, and uh, authors who are now saying, oh, I question my Christianity. Oh, I'm no longer a Christian. Oh, this, this, that. Really, you never understood your trials in relation to the sovereignty of God, if that's the case. Amen? Amen. You don't understand that there's going to come some problems in this life. There's going to be trouble in this life. Amen? There's going to be trouble in this life. That is true. That is a 100% given. But what does John tell us here? Go back to the passage. It's not yet appeared as what we shall be. But when we know that, when he appears, we shall be like, we're playing for overtime. We're playing for extra innings. Our game doesn't end in the ninth or at the end of the fourth, right? Our game goes on. Quit thinking that it is just here and now. John never had that. Paul never said that. Matthew, Mark, Luke never said that. And so we need to remember there is more to this life than this life. Our future hope is that when Jesus comes, we will be like him. Or when we go to be with him, we will certainly be like him. And I want you to see, John writes here three very important truths about this fact. Our future state, first of all, our future state is not yet completely revealed or known. 
Who here can tell me everything about what our future state's going to be? Good. I'm glad nobody raised their hand, because I would tell you you're a liar. All right? We don't know totally, but we sure do have some great glimpses, don't we? Isn't it exciting? You know, I think about what my dad, my mom, I think about what my grandparents, what they're experiencing right now. I think about, you know, a couple of my nephews. I think about some different ones, uh, what they're experiencing in the presence of Christ. Isn't it exciting to think about? Uh, I don't know if many of you know, Dick Cozine passed away yesterday and, and uh, just heard that news. He's in the presence of God. In the presence of God. Well, you know, yes, we're sad. We're sorry for what has happened to people when they pass away, when they die, for, but we, we've lost that. But we need to think about it in the bigger picture as well, right? They've been able to experience what we've been looking forward to all this time. And so he says, our future state is not yet completely revealed or known. Look at verse 2. And has not yet appeared as what we will be. And this means two things. John says that when Jesus appears, we will be like him. Our future state of glorified perfection, sinlessness, wholeness is not our present experience now, right? Amen. Right? Amen. If you don't say amen, I'll ask your spouse. Okay. Right now, our bodies are frail. They're failing. I've got my standby readers on here in case my eyes aren't working well today. Our, our love is imperfected in holiness. As Paul writes in Colossians chapter 3, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Can any of you remember as kids, if you're old enough to remember... Uh, Monty Hall, right? And, and what was it with the, what, let's make a deal. And then there'd be behind curtain number what, right? And the curtains would pull back and, and it would be revealed. And sometimes it was just junk, right? But sometimes it would be the Hawaiian vacation or the Cadillac Burritz or the whatever else. And you were waiting for it to be revealed. And when it was revealed, you know, the contestants would just flip out, wouldn't they? They just loved it. They'd, they'd attack Monty Hall, give him hugs and kisses and all the rest of that. And, uh, and they were just, just waiting for what would be revealed. That should be our expectation. Waiting for what is going to be revealed. Don't cling too much to this life. There's a better one coming. Our future transformation is linked to seeing Jesus just as he is. This is the second point. Our future transformation is linked to seeing Jesus just as he is. And I believe that what John is saying here is the moment we see Jesus, we will become like him. At that moment when he comes or we go, we will be totally sanctified, body, soul, spirit, the evil, the sin, the, the muck, the, the filth, the hurt, the pain, the suffering of this life will be gone in an instant. Paul captured the eternal remedy to evil and suffering in Romans 8, 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time, this present age, are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be what? Revealed to us. The curtain gets pulled back. And as I said, it's way better than the Cadillac or the, uh, the Hawaiian vacation. It's the eternal vacation. After sighting of this present times are not worth comparing with the glory of of what is to come. C.S. Lewis said in The Problem of Pain, uh, it was a, a book on suffering, uh, which uh, uh, says, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, I just got messed up here in, my, in what I was saying. Scripture and traditionally habitually puts the joys of heaven into the scale against the sufferings of earth, and no solution of the problem of pain, which does not do so, can be called a Christian one. Suffering can be the road of transforming grace. Sorry, that is what Lewis said. I got mixed up there. Suffering can be the road of transforming grace in our lives. But we pray, God, don't let me suffer. I don't want to suffer. Right? We all pray that. I don't want to suffer. You don't want to suffer, correct? Nobody's signing up for suffering, right? Okay, just making sure. Uh, but, but we are told that in our suffering... It is part of God's redemptive work of transforming grace that takes place within us. Our present sufferings must be seen in the light of the promise of our eternal 
happiness in God. The scales can never be balanced out in this life alone. So many people say, oh, you know, uh, is, it, is it justice ever going to be done in this life? Probably not. I'm okay with that. You know, probably not. Bad people are going to do wicked things. They're going to get away with a lot of it in this life. Not in the next. There's going to be a judgment, right? Our future transformation, third, is certain, and it will be instantaneous. Notice the confidence with which John asserts these truths. He says, what? I speculate? No. What's he say? We know. Verse 2. We know that when he appears. We know that. Not we speculate, not we guess, not I hope, not maybe. It's not the weatherman offering his, you know, options of weather for this coming Friday or whatever. No, he is saying, we know with 100% certainty. Dr. Francis Schaeffer pointed out years ago many of the fallacies of modern thinking. And one of the things he said, modern thought attempts to relegate faith to an upper story uh, uh, rather than recognizing that it is rooted in historic facts. The modern skeptic will say things like, and it's only gotten worse since Dr. Schaefer passed away, you can have your truth and that can be different from my truth. The Bible, however, is clear to state that its truth, all of its truth, is to be believed. It's all historically validated. It's all believable. It is all inspired by God. It is all inspired. Every word is inspired. It's absolutely certain. It's positive. You can trust it. Paul's great commentary on this truth, and I've read it probably at just about every funeral I've ever performed. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. There's a great change of coming. The Apostle John saw Jesus with his own eyes, right? He saw him, he saw, he saw his resurrected body, he saw, he realized all this and what it was going to be. He says, we're going to be changed. We're going to be changed. That should motivate us to live righteous lives today. Third and finally, understand our present position and future hope motivates us to grow in Christ. As believers, what's it say here? We are to fix our hope on Jesus. We sang that in that, very, in that first worship song today, the one that we did in Poland. And again, if we look at the passage, verse 3 does not say that if we have our hope in Christ that we ought to purify ourselves, like it's optional for us to do this. Rather, it says that everyone who has this hope will or does purify himself. What I say at the beginning? The proof is in the pudding, right? How we act, what our words are, if they line up or if they don't line up. Look at, if we really understand verse 2, we will do verse 3, right? To fix means to train, uh, to focus with an intensity. If you like shooting, you fix your sights on something. You line them up. You, you, you know, you go through that process and of breathing it out and squeezing the trigger. You're, while all the while you're keeping your, your sights focused on what it is you're, you're going to shoot at. To fix our hope on Christ means to concentrate on him. Concentrate on him. We need to come to know Christ in his holiness. In his holiness, in the holiness of Christ, it is this recurring theme that we have seen throughout 1 John. And look at, uh, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, he is light, there's no darkness in him. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, Jesus Christ is the righteous. 1 John 2, uh, verse 20, refers to Jesus as the Holy One. Uh, 1 John 2, verse 29, it affirms that he is the righteous one. 
Here we see that he is pure. Not only is Jesus ceremonially pure, but he is the purest form of anything that's pure. The Bible speaks of this glorious future hope. When we will see Jesus and that vision of the Savior will transform us. Transform us. However, as we are here and now, allow that the understanding of what that's going to be like, allow, John is saying, allow that to do its purifying work on you here and now too. Grow in God's grace that he gives to you. Grow in the means of grace. You know, participate in the worship. Read the word of God. Listen to the preaching of the word of God. Study the scripture. Take communion. Be baptized if you're not baptized. Participate in those things. Run the race for the joy that is set before you. Some people complain. We all complain, right? From time to time, some people get a doctorate in it, right? They specialize in it. We complain about the Christian life is so hard. It's so hard. Nonsense. Jesus said, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and I will disclose myself to him. If we want Jesus to disclose or reveal himself to us, we obey him. It, it becomes not a vicious cycle, but a victorious cycle. Where when we obey, we see more of Christ. When we disobey, when we give in to sinful tantrums and the like, we end up being further away or our fellowship uh, further away from the Lord and where we should be. There is a transforming power in realizing that we are going to be with him. There's a transforming power of realizing that one day he's coming back to me or I'm going to go to be with him. And you know what? There's no monetary value you can put on that, is there? Years ago, not only the Olympics, but even... Uh, more modern athletic events, there were oftentimes, there was no monetary value associated with winning it, winning the Olympics. Uh, there was not, it didn't used to be a monetary value associated with it. Uh, the Tour de France, uh, for the first several years, there was, I, now it's like a multi-million dollar, you know, thing that people win when they win the Tour de France. But years ago, uh, you didn't even win a, a monetary prize. The prize was what? Still is, by the way. Yellow jersey. Yellow jersey, all these men, all these people, you know, killing themselves. Uh, race covers what, nearly 2,000 miles, going through the Alps, going through all this sort of, really, for a yellow jersey? I think not, right? I'll take green anyways, right, but not yellow. Uh, why? Because that's what's to be focused on winning. What are you focusing on in this life? What is it that you're running the race for? We must purify ourselves now so that we will grow like him. John says, verse 3, everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself. We need to maintain a biblical balance, a biblical tension here, right? <clears throat> Paul says that God has predestined us to become conformed to the image of his son. In that sense, it's a done deal clearly. But God also says here in his inspired word, even though that is the case, you better participate, right? The participation is the proof. You can't just passively sit by and say, well, this is going to happen or it's not going to happen, but I don't have to do anything. Yeah, you don't understand grace if that's the mindset. Therefore, we have these precious promises, beloved. Let us cleanse ourselves from all the defilement, the flesh, the spirit, the perfecting holiness and the fear of God. He commands Timothy, keep himself pure from sin. In James, James says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Peter says that the believers have purified their souls, so there is a definite sense in which, guess what? We are to be active in this. What's it mean for us? It means there are no meaningless moments in life. Don't think that there are meaningless moments in life. Realize that in all of life, you can contemplate on the glory of God. God created us to live for him and his glory. Our chief calling, our chief end is that whatever we do, we're to do it for his glory, right? 
We don't ultimately work for our own pleasure, our own entertainment, our own self-improvement, even our own gain. We work for God and his glory, and we are to glorify him in all that we do. And it's not just in those moments when you're the one selected to sing the solo on Sunday morning, or you hold up the, the, the Super Bowl trophy, or, or whatever else the award is that, that we may think is the great thing to do. It is also seen in the mundane, difficult parts of everyday living. When you wash your wife's car, when you cut your neighbor's grass, when you go to work even though you can't stand your boss and you're trying to make him or her a success even though they don't think the same about you. When you're putting up with whatever it is that your neighbor does or your loved one does, you glorify God in the midst of everyday life in how you react and how you respond. You think about Paul. Paul glorified God whether he was shipwrecked, uh, whether what he was sitting in jail, you know. Uh, you can think of all the different ones. God's glory motivates us to do great things, and it reminds us of our ultimate reward. Yes, our trials in life are hard, but God's great reward makes them appear, what does Paul say? Light and momentary, temporary. When Jimmy Carter was president, he really promoted this populist image. You know, that he was a, a man of the people. He was a man of the people. And, uh, and on several occasions, he spent the night in homes of common people. And, uh, and of course, he didn't just drop in unannounced. You know? <laughs> Presidents don't do that. Even though if they want to make it look like they do, they don't do that, right? And so those people had fair warning that he was coming on a particular date, and they would agreed to the visit. And, you know, President uh, Carter walked out of plain little houses and, you know, plain little towns and, and, and he's from Plains, that was why I said it. But uh, he, he did that, and, you know, people looked and said, oh, boy, you know, isn't that something? But they had fair warning. They got to get their houses cleaned up, right? Stories also told President Eisenhower. Read the article in the paper about an event that had happened to a family, and he, he actually showed up at that family's home unannounced on a Saturday morning. And the man came to the door, and his wife beat her T-shirt, and his, you know, his face was all... He nodded and shaved, and his hair was a muck, and the house was unpicked. And President Eisenhower stood at the door, and the man didn't let him in because his house was a mess. <laughs> do you do that to a president? I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. Well, look at it this way. God's going to come to your house one day. Christ's going to come to your house. Is your house going to be picked up, or is it going to be filthy? You got fair warning today. Right? You got fair warning. He who has this hope within him purifies what? Himself. Be prepared. Be prepared. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, for the hope that you have put within us. That, Lord, we have this hope. And even though we are in a, a frail body, uh, even though, uh, as the scripture says, we're, we're in clay pots, we have this, this hope within us. We have this thing of eternal value that you have placed within every one of your children. And so, Lord, help us to recognize those areas where we need to cooperate with the grace that you have to walk faithfully with you in our lives. And so, Father, we thank you. We pray today these things, asking that you'd be glorified in our lives and with us today. Wherefore, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen.